In April this year, four banks in the Henan province of China announced that they were freezing deposits of around $6 billion while they updated their IT systems. Depositors worried at first, but began to panic in late April when they learned that a major shareholder of the four banks had been arrested for serious financial crimes. A few months later, news hit of a group of home buyers around China who were threatening to stop making mortgage payments on apartments in building projects that had yet to be completed. While Chinese media has portrayed these two stories as minor events that are unrelated to each other and driven by very specific local circumstances, they might instead be symptoms of a much greater issue in the Chinese financial system. The frozen bank deposits led to protests and then bank runs. Then on May 21st, a large demonstration was held outside the office of the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission. Police stepped in to disperse the protesters, but this only drew national attention to what was going on. Municipal authorities even changed the COVID public health codes for people traveling to the protests, preventing them from using public transportation or assembling in public spaces. This abuse of the public health systems led to outrage throughout China, causing the government in Beijing to intervene. Local authorities initially claimed that the red health codes were caused by a computer glitch, but after an investigation, five local officials were punished for wrongdoing. The protests didn't end, and on July 10th, a larger protest outside the People's Bank of China turned violent as the peaceful protesters were violently attacked, leading to numerous hospitalizations. Videos of the violence went viral, drawing sympathy to the protesters, and the local officials were widely criticized for their behavior. There were a few interesting things about the Henan banks that froze up in April. They were all small rural banks that historically had focused on local economic activity in the rural areas that they serve. Banks like these are at the riskier end of the spectrum in the Chinese banking system, as they usually struggle to attract deposits from their less affluent rural customers, and they can't diversify their deposit base or their lending books, as their remote settings mean that their customers are usually employed in agriculture, which can be a boom or bust business, where either all of their customers are doing well all at once, or they're all struggling financially at the same time. This makes for a difficult banking environment. In recent years, with the advent of new online financial services platforms or fintechs, small banks like these worked out that they could attract money from savers all over the country by offering online deals to customers to deposit their savings. They might offer higher interest rates of around 4% to online customers all over the country who agreed to lock up their money for a year. These deals might additionally include the option to extend this interest rate for up to five years. And of course, this optionality is valuable too. Due to government concerns that these online platforms were easy to abuse, many of them were made illegal in early 2021, but it appears that their use still persisted well into 2022. By offering high interest rates on these platforms, the four rural banks that eventually froze up were able to draw funding from around the province and even neighboring provinces. For this reason, when things went wrong, it immediately mattered to more than just local rural communities. The day after the violent protests, it was announced that members of a criminal gang had been arrested under suspicion of various serious crimes relating to illegal loan issuance and transfer of funds. The gang was said to have gained control of several village banks, including the four that had frozen up, by illicit means, sold financial products through their platform and set up shell companies to hide where the money had gone. By this point, similar problems had been discovered at two more banks in a neighboring province. Mostly because of the attention that the protests had drawn to the issue, financial regulators began ordering partial payments to local depositors two days later. Small depositors were repaid first, and every week or two repayments were announced for accounts of increasing size. 
On August the 5th, it was announced that individuals with accounts of up to the equivalent of $35,000 were to be repaid. There were, of course, bigger accounts that are still hoping to get their money back. So were the deposits insured then? Well, there is supposed to be deposit insurance in China, as a deposit insurance system was announced in 2014, covering deposits of up to the equivalent of around $70,000. But the deposit insurance fund management company said that the online deposits were not insured, as they had not been banking deposits. The money had been invested in other assets, and while it's unclear if the depositors were aware of this, they should have known that they were earning much higher interest rates than normal bank deposits, which should indicate that there was additional risk. So that's the bank runs, but as this was going on, and perhaps even taking inspiration from these protests, an online group called We Need Homes appeared, and members of this group began to threaten to stop making payments on their mortgages. Why were these people upset? Well, they wanted something done to guarantee the completion of the homes that they had paid for in full, which were showing no signs of being built. By the end of July, more than 320 property projects around the country were affected by this mortgage boycott. Many of you might be wondering why people would be making mortgage payments on homes that have not yet been constructed. Well, the Chinese home buying market has some peculiarities. It's not that unusual in hot real estate markets around the world for people to buy an apartment off the plans like they do in China. But in most parts of the world, this just involves putting down a deposit to reserve a place. And home buyers will usually only do this if the developer can show that they have insurance so that if the developer goes bust before delivering the home, the buyer can get their deposit back. In China, however, the home buyer pays the entire price of the home in full when they decide to buy. And they often do this at a point when only the most basic work has been done to signal the start of construction. This usually means that they take a mortgage and start making monthly payments well before the home is completed. This means that Chinese developers can raise an awful lot of money very quickly through announcing sales, and they often use this money to buy up even more land and expand their businesses. The history of private home ownership is quite short in China. When Mao took power in 1949, the state seized all private property, and the state continued to own all private property up until the 1980s, when Deng Xiaoping began experimenting with private property ownership in select cities. Today, all land is still government-owned in China, but it's leased out to those willing to develop the land. When someone buys a home from a property developer, they don't own the land, they just take over the lease on the land, which for residential property lasts 70 years. If the lease was granted to developers 10 years ago, but the apartment was just completed, home buyers might have only 60 years left in the home. So what happens when those leases expire? Well, there have only been a few cases in which this has happened, as this approach is still quite new. But in 2002, some 20-year land leases in Shenzhen expired, and property holders there had to pay 35% of the assessed value of the property for a 40-year extension on their lease. If you didn't pay for an extension, you would receive only the depreciated cost of the building materials on the plot as compensation. China does have laws requiring builders to deposit enough money to complete construction into government-supervised escrow accounts, but local governments and banks often override this requirement. There is, of course, a conflict of interest here, as the local governments don't raise revenue through property taxes, they instead raise revenue by leasing land to property developers. Allowing the property developers to sidestep escrow rules means that the property developers have more capital and can compete with each other to lease even more land for development, and that money goes to the local governments. 
As you can imagine, pre-selling apartments is a very cheap source of financing for Chinese developers, and they have of course made the most of the situation. What they do is they start projects, announce pre-sales at a rate well beyond what they can be reasonably expected to complete in a timely manner. And you can see this clearly on this chart, which shows the growing gap between property starts and property completions in China over the last decade. Now, in such a situation, home buyers are going to find themselves waiting longer and longer to get the homes that they've paid for. And you might wonder why they would put up with this. Well, Chinese home buyers have mostly been happy enough with this situation, as home prices have historically risen in value at a much faster rate than the rate of interest on their mortgages. And many of them think of the purchase as an investment rather than as a home that they're planning on living in. So for the longest time, property developers were able to raise a lot of money through pre-sales, use this money to buy more land for development, and all of this capital raising and land purchasing just drove land and property prices up in a self-reinforcing manner. When people saw their friends and neighbors getting rich by borrowing money to buy homes, which were never delivered, but inflated in value, they rushed to join the party. People who were conservative and chose not to participate were financially left behind. Similarly, property developers who behaved responsibly, completing projects before announcing new ones, were soon dwarfed in size by their more aggressive competitors, who had bought up huge swathes of land and had grown unimaginably rich. The problem with this, of course, is that it only works when property prices rise. And when they fall in value, home buyers, or really property speculators, find themselves making monthly payments on a home that hasn't been built. And not only that, it's falling in value. We're now left with a situation where property developers have a huge backlog of homes to build, but they've spent most of the deposits that they've taken on land that is now pretty much impossible to sell. The group threatening to not pay their mortgages, according to the Chinese press, were not property speculators hoping to make a quick buck. They were often working class people who had bought inexpensive homes in the outskirts of smaller cities. These people were actually hoping to live in them, and it's not surprising that this group were the first to get angry and to take action. Over the last year, property prices have declined in two-thirds of Chinese cities, and the price declines have been the most severe in the smaller cities, and that's where the mortgage boycotts have been concentrated. The market for new homes has collapsed in China, and news of bank runs and mortgage boycotts have only made the situation worse. The Chinese press reports that in the first two weeks of July, in 30 major cities, in terms of floor space, new home sales have more than halved, partially driven by the news of mortgage boycotts. The situation is so bad that several property developers have advertised that they would accept food, including peaches, watermelons and garlic, as down payments on new homes. The threatened mortgage boycott got the attention of authorities, with some officials initially warning that a failure to pay mortgages would result in serious long-term consequences. The authorities were concerned that if a boycott on unfinished homes was successful, that the boycott strategy might spread to other homeowners who had received their apartments but were just upset because the property prices were falling. That would be much more of a problem. Authorities eventually responded by allowing home buyers to temporarily halt mortgage payments on undelivered property without incurring penalties, but eligibility and the length of the grace periods would be decided by local governments and banks. They also took steps to expedite the completion of building projects around the country, where local governments were asked to take steps to push the uncompleted projects forward, and China's banking regulator urged banks to increase lending to make these completions happen. It's rumored that local state-owned enterprises will take control and ownership of uncompleted projects in order to get them completed. 
The problem with this solution, though, is that many of these local governments are struggling with tight budgets as they typically raise money by leasing land to real estate developers, and demand for new land leases has dried up. Both the bank runs and mortgage boycotts are symptoms of the significant strains in the Chinese financial system after years of soaring non-productive investment and a property bubble. The fall in property prices is causing these problems, but also highlighting weaknesses in the financial system, like the issues with deposit insurance. The problem in the financial system is not a liquidity issue that can be worked around. There's been a huge growth in debt to fund malinvestment in both real estate and unnecessary public infrastructure, which is worth less than the debt that was taken on to pay for it. The core issue is that this rise in debt has been well beyond the growth of the borrower's ability to service that debt. Most of the solutions being put forth for the problems in the Chinese financial system don't actually solve any problems. They're mostly just ways of postponing a painful situation by restructuring and extending these losses further out into the future. Economies that follow these types of loss deferral strategies tend to recover much more slowly than economies that face up to their problems, allow necessary bankruptcies and move on. There are huge losses sitting there in China due to decades of malinvestment that are only now being recognized by the state, and eventually some sector of the economy will have to absorb those losses. The losses are real and can be absorbed by the central government in Beijing, the banking sector, the local government sector, the business sector, Chinese households, or some combination of that list. The wealth transfers required to fill the holes that exist can come from increased taxes on either individuals or businesses, defaults, currency appreciation, inflation or wage suppression. There are many ways that this situation can resolve itself, but one way or another it will be a political decision where the central government decides who the winners and losers are going to be. The losses can't be erased, the only question is which sector of the economy will be forced to take the loss. The decision as to who takes these losses will of course have huge long-term economic implications. Due to the Chinese Communist Party's upcoming National Congress in mid-October, Chinese regulators are likely to prioritize stability between now and then. Any additional financial issues that crop up will be quickly dealt with by local government borrowing and the bigger banks. The same sort of thing that we've seen so far. There's a chance that we'll see a lot of economic stimulus to kickstart the property market and increase confidence amongst lenders and bank depositors. It doesn't seem very likely that the costs of these losses will be pushed to the business sector through higher taxes or lower subsidies, as this would likely grind growth to a halt in China. It's equally unlikely to see these costs being allocated to the agriculture or the mining sectors, as it would appear that the government is aiming to grow these sectors to make the country more self-sufficient. That leaves us with the government sector and large government-owned banks as being most able to absorb both the costs of these losses and the cost of rebalancing the economy away from real estate and infrastructure investment, which makes up a huge percentage of Chinese GDP. It's very hard to predict what will happen, though, as this will be very politically driven. If you found this interesting, you should watch my video on the international consequences of China's slowdown next, as China makes up a very large percentage of global growth. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.